Hello everyone. In this video, I've put together a mega compilation of 35 full advanced English vocabulary lessons with the complete meanings, plenty of sentence examples, and lots of additional explanations and usage tips. By watching this video, you will be able to completely understand all these difficult English words and use them with confidence. I hope you find it useful to have all these lessons in one place. You can use the timestamps in the description to choose specific words if you'd like. All these lessons can be found separately on the channel and I'll include a playlist link in the description as well. Now let's get started. Hyperbole. Hyperbole. If you don't watch this video, your efforts to understand English words will completely and utterly fail. You may as well give up on ever becoming completely fluent in English if you aren't going to watch the rest of this. I hope you understood that I was just exaggerating. In fact, I was using what is called hyperbole. I could suggest that this video may be good to watch to understand the meaning of the English word hyperbole, but if I say you can't learn English without it, I'm overstating the matter greatly, to say the least. I'm making the video seem much more important and impressive than it actually is. And that is the meaning of hyperbole. Hyperbole is a noun meaning something written or spoken that makes something sound much more important, more impressive, more urgent, more dangerous, etc. than it really is. If I say, I'm the most talented guitar player to ever live, that is also hyperbole. The adjective form of hyperbole is hyperbolic. My statement at the beginning of this video was a hyperbolic statement. Although hyperbole can simply refer to any instance of gross exaggeration, in literature or creative works it is often a figure of speech or a literary device used to express humor or great emotion. A good way to think of hyperbole is, as Vocabulary.com puts it, extravagant exaggeration. We use hyperbole all the time in English without even thinking about it and, in fact, without other people even noticing it. Hyperbole is a feature of idiomatic and colloquial language and it's often used simply for effect. For example, I can't afford a bazillion dollars for a new car. I'm on a tight budget. This box weighs a ton. I don't want to drive all that way. It's like a million miles. This is literally the worst day of my life. Hyperbole is also a part of what we call a fish story in English. This is when someone claims to have caught a fish that was much larger than it really was. That fish weighed as much as I do, I tell ya. You'll find that all fish stories are, well, fish stories. But a fish story doesn't have to be about a fish. It has become an idiom that refers to any such hyperbolic story. Notes on pronunciation. The prefix hyper means above, beyond, or super. Hyperbole is pronounced differently than many other hyper words in English. Normally, the stress is on the first syllable or the third syllable, as in hyperlink, hyperventilate, or hypertension. Instead, the stress falls on the second syllable, per, hyperbole. Also, you'll notice that while B-O-L-E seems like it should be pronounced like the word bowl, it is pronounced bully. This pronunciation is similar to the original Greek word which influenced the Latin word from which we derive the term. Amazingly, there was an Athenian politician named Hyperbolus during the 5th century BC. He was extremely prone to hyperbole and was constantly stoking the passions of the crowds he spoke to. But can you believe that he actually had nothing to do with the history of this word? Examples of how to use hyperbole in a sentence. 
I always thought that the hype about the genius of Steve Jobs was hyperbole. I've seen nothing to convince me otherwise. If we don't stop them now, they will destroy our democracy. This isn't mere hyperbole. This is a clear and present danger. They claim that their ads were simple hyperbole and that no reasonable person would think that the claims were true. However, the FTC didn't buy this argument and made the company pay a huge fine and stop making the misleading and untrue claims. Some of the best jokes are based on hyperbole. The network is defending itself by saying that everybody knows that they rely on hyperbole to entertain their audience. One of my pet peeves is the oft-used hyperbolic statement, it'll change your life. Mundane. Mundane. Something that is mundane is very ordinary and uninteresting. Something not unusual or commonplace. Or something routine and not very exciting or dull. Something unremarkable. Or something workaday and humdrum. Also, mundane can describe things that are of this earthly world rather than a heavenly or spiritual one. In other words, something relating to the world and worldly matters. Examples of how to use mundane in a sentence. It's hard returning to my mundane life after spending time on the ocean. Even the most mundane artifacts are useful and intriguing to archaeologists. I don't concern myself with mundane matters, only spiritual ones. My life is just so mundane. I need a new interest, something exciting and absorbing. Sure, my job is mundane and repetitive, but it's a paycheck and I have lots of time to think. Archival work can become very monotonous and mundane, but every now and again, something extraordinary appears. After being stuck in bed for weeks, even mundane tasks like dishwashing were a treat. Feasible. 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 When something is feasible, it is capable of being done, being made, or achieved, possible or likely to succeed, such as a feasible plan. Suitable or capable of being used or dealt with successfully, such as a feasible schedule. Sometimes as well, feasible means likely, probable, or within reason, such as a feasible story or explanation. Here are some examples of how to use feasible in a sentence. Is it feasible? She asks. Yes, it's feasible, but it's going to cost a lot of money. It's not feasible to continue. If we keep using this treatment, his life may be in danger. We have to improve the road before we can start building. This old dirt road is not feasible for trucks, especially when it rains. His story is feasible, but he's lied before. We can't give everybody a bonus this year. It's just not financially feasible. Working from home is not feasible for most people. I am lucky to be able to do it. Technically, personal jetpacks are feasible, but they are much too expensive and dangerous. Also, the noun version of feasible is feasibility. The committee is studying the feasibility of monthly checks to all citizens. The adverb form of feasible is feasibly. A treatment is only feasibly useful if the side effects are manageable over the treatment period. Caveat. 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 A caveat is a condition, limitation, stipulation, or warning added to a general statement, recommendation, or agreement. When someone adds a caveat, they are saying that you must consider this additional information before weighing the value of the statement or acting on the information or entering into the agreement. It is a caution or admonition for your consideration. 
Here are some examples of how to use caveat in a sentence. The author agreed to license the movie rights to his books with the caveat that he himself write the screenplay. The vaccine is getting into more arms, but you must consider this one caveat. We are wasting thousands of doses which could be put to good use. The legislator has stripped the governor of the extraordinary emergency powers he was given during the emergency. With one caveat, he still has the power to extend orders he has already issued. Sometimes a caveat is a qualification. A qualification, in this sense of the word, is a statement or assertion that makes another statement less absolute or valuable. I'm going to also explain the legal definition of caveat with one caveat. I'm not an expert on legal terms, and I do less research on them than on general English terms. In legal terms, a caveat is a formal notice given to a judicial officer, such as a judge or other public official, to notify him or her that they should suspend a certain proceeding or action until the opposing party has been given an opportunity to be heard. Most typically, these legal caveats are filed in probate hearings when someone wants to challenge the validity of a will. They want to stop the court from administering the estate until this opposing party is notified. A caveat can also be a warning or admonition. In this way, it is most famously used in the Latin phrase caveat emptor, which means let the buyer beware. This means that the person who buys something must take responsibility for the quality of the goods that he or she is buying instead of the seller, and it's usually used to warn people against doing business with a certain party with a reputation for dishonesty. Someone who doesn't want to stand behind his or her goods or services, and is in idiomatic terms, fly by night. However, it may also apply to a situation where used goods are sold very cheaply, such as a flea market. Quibble, quibble. When someone quibbles, they are arguing or complaining about something unimportant or largely irrelevant. To quibble is to raise a trivial objection or criticism, to dwell on something unimportant, to argue about petty things, or to nitpick. As a noun, a quibble is any such minor objection or unimportant complaint. A quibble can also be an evasion or shift away from the central point of an argument or discussion. The verb quibble is often used in the phrasal verb quibble over. When you quibble over something small, you argue or complain about it even though it is unimportant. And the noun quibble is often used in the somewhat redundant term minor quibble. Examples of how to use quibble in a sentence. From the movie Braveheart, 1995, we cannot defeat them. We can and we will. We won at Sterling and still you quibble. There is no point quibbling over 5% equity, said the investor. I have no quibbles with the book. I just wish it wasn't so overpriced. From the movie High Fidelity, 2000, I hate to quibble with you, Rob, but Allison married her first boyfriend. I love Amazon's no quibble return policy. We quibble over the silliest things, like the definition of barbecue, but what do you expect after such a long marriage? Abrupt. Abrupt. When something is abrupt, it is unexpected and happens very suddenly. The abrupt change in the weather forced us to end our fishing trip. When a person is abrupt, it means that they talk to people in an unfriendly and brief way. In other words, an abrupt person uses too few words when they talk in a way that seems rude and unfriendly. He has an abrupt and arrogant manner and even his family doesn't like being around him. You can also reply to someone in an abrupt manner. A reply that is abrupt is rude and overly brief. In other words, curt or brusque. His abrupt reply and inattentive manner was unusual for such an outgoing and friendly person. As an adverb, abrupt becomes abruptly. 
More examples of how to use abrupt in a sentence. The movie was very interesting, but the ending was a bit abrupt and didn't make much sense. The meeting ended abruptly when the fire alarm went off. His abrupt manner with customers definitely cost him business, but there was not a better antique dealer for miles. The mountain seems gentle at first, but there is an abrupt increase in its steepness at around 1,000 feet. Flack. Flack. Although the primary spelling of the word flack is F-L-A-K, it is sometimes spelled F-L-A-C-K. The word flak comes from a military word related to aircraft. In the military, flak refers to anti-aircraft guns or the shells or bullets fired from them. If a military aircraft flies into heavy flak, it means that it encounters weapons fire from the ground. The word flak was also lent to a type of body armor called a flak jacket or flak vest, which is designed to protect soldiers from the flying fragments or frag from anti-aircraft artillery and any type of high explosive weaponry, including mines. These are not the same as bulletproof vests. The word flak, however, is most often used by the general public to refer to strong criticism or opposition. If you are getting flack from someone, they are severely criticizing you. If you take flack or take the flack, you are getting the blame for something. Here are some examples of how to use the word flack in a sentence. My family gave me a lot of flack about becoming a musician, but music is my true passion. I caught a lot of flack at work about my new tattoo. The new president takes a lot of flack about his stance on immigration. Apple deserves the flack it gets because of its anti-repair designs, not to mention its desire to stop customers from having their phones repaired by third parties. The company is taking plenty of flack about its union blocking activities and its treatment of workers. You can easily understand how this word came to be used in this more general way. To be taking flack is to be taking enemy fire. It can be used to refer to any type of criticism, blame, or general abuse. Alias. Alias. An alias is an assumed name, a false name, a pseudonym, etc. It is any name that someone uses other than their legal or given name. This includes names used by criminals to evade law enforcement, a name used by a spy or undercover agent, a stage name used by a performer, an author's pen name, or even a name used on social media. Although alias is a noun, it is also used as an adverb to mean the same as aka or also known as, but only for people, not objects. Lawrence Turode, alias Mr. T, became famous as a cast member of the classic TV show The A-Team. Usage Notes Although an alias technically refers to any assumed name, the term is usually reserved for those names adopted by criminals, spies, undercover agents, etc. An author's assumed name is usually called a pseudonym, a pen name, or a nom de plume. A performer's assumed name is usually called a stage name. A name used on social media is called a screen name or username. Examples of how to use alias in a sentence. The FBI agent's favorite alias was Crockett A. Tubbs for obvious reasons. Al Capone, alias Scarface, was a notorious mobster during the Prohibition era in Chicago. We have reason to believe the suspect is in Jackson Hole and is using an alias. A co-conspirator of John Wilkes Booth, Lewis Thornton Powell, alias Lewis Payne, attempted to assassinate Secretary of State William Henry Stewart at the same time that Booth assassinated Lincoln.
dupe. Dupe. To dupe someone is to deceive or trick them. To dupe someone especially means to trick someone into doing something they did not want to do or did not intend to do. It can also mean to make them believe something that is not true. Here are some examples of how to use the verb dupe in a sentence. Tom Sawyer duped his friend into whitewashing the fence for him. You've been duped. The IRS would never send you a text message telling you to go to a website and pay. Jeff tried to dupe me into letting him borrow my car in exchange for helping with my yard work. I know he's too lazy to do any work. Dupe is primarily used as a verb, but it can also be a noun, which is how the word began in English. To call someone a dupe means that they are easily deceived or led astray. A fool. He was a con artist, always looking for another dupe. Dupe is also used as a shortened slang word for duplicate. This can refer to any copy of a document or video. The word dupe is used in the film industry to refer to a duplicate negative used for making additional release prints or for making special effects to be inserted into the release negative. A duplicate videotape may also be called a dupe. However, since videotapes are now obsolete, this usage is becoming obsolete. As well, this word sometimes applies to copycat, if not counterfeit, products, ones made to resemble famous and expensive designer goods, such as clothing. You can get clothing that looks and wears exactly like famous designer brands. These dupes are a fraction of the price. Touchy. Touchy. If someone is touchy, it means that they are sensitive, easily offended, upset, or irritated. A touchy person is easily provoked and ready to take offense over even the smallest thing. Be careful what you say to Steven, he's very touchy. Sorry, I didn't know you were so touchy. I didn't mean to upset you. A person can be touchy in general or they can be touchy about a particular subject. He's touchy about his past drug use. You'd better not bring it up. The word touchy can also describe a subject or a situation. We say a touchy subject or a touchy situation. When something is touchy, it needs to be dealt with carefully. It requires care and caution. My brother's incarceration is a touchy subject in my family. It's a touchy situation when people who work together get romantically involved. Touchy is also used to describe body parts that are sensitive to touch or that are easily irritated and cause pain when touched. How does your arm feel? It's touchy, but it's getting better. Touchy can also mean highly flammable or easily ignited. You have to be careful with this chemical. It's very touchy. The word techy is sometimes used to replace touchy. Techy sounds like a slang version of touchy, but it's actually a very old word with the same meaning. Techy may be, in fact, the etymological origin of touchy. Bedlam. Bedlam. Bedlam is a scene, situation, or state of great confusion, uproar, madness, chaos, noisiness, etc. In a state of bedlam, there is no sense of order and everything is chaotic and out of control. There was bedlam in the streets as people reacted to the latest injustice. After the fire alarm went off, he was lucky to make his way through the bedlam of shoving and screaming people to find the emergency exit. Historical origin of the word bedlam. The word bedlam came about as a contraction of the name of a hospital in London. The hospital started out in 1247 as a priory for the Order of St. Mary of Bethlehem. This priory eventually became the Hospital of St. Mary of Bethlehem and was meant to serve sick, poor, and homeless people. 
However, by 1405, the hospital was under royal control and had begun to be partly used as an insane asylum, the first of its kind in England. The name of the hospital had already been slurred to Bedlam in popular speech, helped along by the variant spelling Bethlehem, and soon an inmate of the asylum also started to be called a Bedlam as well. Bedlam was not always the most well-run or inspected of establishments. There were periods of great brutality and deplorable conditions. In his 1657 diary, John Evelyns describes miserable creatures in chains. The hospital became known as a place of noisy, raving lunatics, and wealthy people even took to visiting it to be entertained by their antics. It is estimated that around 100,000 people a year visited the institution for this purpose, and the hospital was a model for the kind of excesses and cruelty that the madhouse came to be associated with. After this, an insane asylum, or madhouse, came to be called bedlam, and the meaning of the word then became extended to mean any riotous noise or scene of noisy confusion. However, after 1857, St. Mary of Bethlehem came under regular government inspection and today it is known as the Bethlehem Royal Hospital, although not located in the same place. Despite its checkered past, it is now a modern psychiatric research institution. Now let's compare the confusing phrases, it was Bedlam versus there was Bedlam. Many times the word Bedlam is used to describe a past situation or scene. People often say, it was Bedlam, or there was Bedlam. In colloquial English, it was Bedlam sounds perfectly natural and understandable. Although I cannot be sure, I think this is the phrase most often used. I should never have gone shopping on Christmas Eve. It was Bedlam out there. As I said, in everyday conversation, this is fine and sounds quite natural. However, it is technically incorrect. Remember, bedlam is a noun. To be quite specific, it is an uncountable or non-count noun. If you say, it was bedlam, you are making bedlam an adjective, referring to the situation or scene as it. The scene was bedlam. This is incorrect if bedlam is a noun. An easy way to understand this is to answer the question, was there food? Can you say, yes, it was food? No, you say, there was food. Was there bedlam at the football game? Yes, there was bedlam. Agnostic. 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 The word agnostic comes from agnosticism. Agnosticism. Agnosticism is often defined as the view that the existence of God or the divine or the supernatural is unknown or unknowable. In other words, we can never be sure of the existence of these things, nor can we definitively deny them. However, strictly speaking, agnosticism is the doctrine that states that humans cannot know of the existence of anything outside of their own experience. The word was first coined in 1869 by T.H. Huxley at a meeting of the Metaphysical Society in London. Huxley was a biologist and he was pushing forward Darwin's theory of evolution. Agnosticism to him was a rejection of Gnosticism, which claimed great knowledge of the very things Huxley himself believed he could not possibly know, especially of the spiritual world. However, the term agnosticism today is used colloquially to refer to skepticism about religious subjects in general. Now that we have the background out of the way, we can get to the meaning of the word agnostic as it is now used in English. An agnostic is most often defined as a person who is skeptical about the existence of God or a God. Such a person neither believes nor disbelieves that a God exists. They simply say that they do not know, and further, they may believe that it is impossible to know. In other words, not only do they not know, but they are not capable of knowing. In my youth, I always went to church because my parents made me go, but I was always agnostic, even then. 
Now, although this next sense of the word agnostic is rarely used colloquially, it refers less specifically to a person who holds the view that anything beyond natural observable phenomena cannot be known by humans. In other words, we can never know anything about an ultimate reality beyond the material universe that our senses can detect, or the supernatural, or the existence of an almighty being, etc. An agnostic may be confused with an atheist. An atheist is a person who believes that God, or a God, does not exist. Just because you accept evolution, or science in general, does not mean you are an agnostic or atheist. Carl Sagan described himself as an agnostic. He believed that the question of God's existence is outside the purview of science. To be agnostic can also mean to have a doubtful or non-committal attitude towards a specific thing. Note that in all cases the word agnostic can be used as a noun, an agnostic, or an adjective. A person is either an agnostic or agnostic about something. I'm fairly agnostic about the chances we will ever abolish the Electoral College. In regards to technology, especially computing, agnostic refers to hardware or software that is compatible with many types of platforms or operating systems. Unless you work in computers or information technology, you probably don't need to be concerned with this use of the word. Boycott. Boycott. If a person or a group of people boycott a business, organization, country, etc., they refuse to have any involvement with it in order to show their disapproval and to force a change in policy, habits, attitude, etc. To boycott a business is to refuse to have dealings with it or to refuse to buy its products or use its services. For instance, to boycott a restaurant means to refuse to eat in it or order food from it. To boycott an event or activity means to refuse to be involved in it or cooperate with it. For instance, many people are actively boycotting Disney's new movie, Mulan. A boycott can be an informal ban voluntarily undertaken by a group of people as a protest or punishment. It can also be an official ban enforced by a government. For example, a government might boycott trade with another country or boycott negotiations. The term boycott comes from 1870s Ireland, where an agricultural crisis caused landowners to increase rents and enforce more evictions of farmers. In response, the farmers formed a land league to protest against these cruel measures. A retired British Army captain named Charles Boycott was acting as an agent for an absentee landlord and when Boycott tried to evict some farmers who could not pay their rent, he was shunned and ostracized by the community. His workers and servants quit and his own crops rotted in the ground. News of this spread and his name soon became synonymous with the protest strategy that caused his misfortune. Examples of how to use boycott in a sentence. Making their strongest statement yet in the fight against racial injustice, players from six NBA teams decided not to play postseason games on Wednesday in a boycott that quickly reverberated across other professional leagues. Many people continue to boycott the restaurant chain Chick-fil-A over its support of anti-LGBTQ causes. Goodyear banned MAGA hats and other political displays, and so Trump called on his supporters to boycott Goodyear. Stores in small towns are able to get away with price gouging during the pandemic because they know that boycotting them would be impossible. There are very few stores from which the locals can choose. Rash rash. As a noun, a rash is an area of irritation on the skin, usually marked by many small red bumps. I need an ointment for my rash. I think it's an allergic reaction to that new laundry detergent. I can't eat strawberries. I'll break out in a rash. 
Also as a noun, rash can mean a large number of unpleasant or undesirable instances in a short period. For example, we've seen a rash of virus cases in the last 24 hours. There has been a rash of home burglaries in the neighborhood. Residents are asked to report any suspicious activity. Rash is also used very commonly as an adjective. Rash as an adjective means careless or unwise, marked by undue haste and done without thinking about the possible consequences, without caution or careful thought beforehand. As well, a person can also be described as rash. Examples of how to use the adjective rash in a sentence. The president's rash decisions have turned this country upside down. You told George about Rachel's ticket? That was a rash thing to do. You know how he gets. He's rash and irritable. He flies off the handle all the time. He rashly denied the impact of global warming. Chide. Chide. To chide someone means to scold or reprimand them mildly, usually with the intention of getting them to improve their behavior or correct a mistake. To rebuke. To remonstrate. To chastise. To find fault with someone. To express disapproval and displeasure with someone's actions. Usage of the word chide. To chide someone doesn't always have the connotation of angry words. Chiding someone can take the form of sarcasm, humor, a gentle reminder, or anger. And to chide also tends to refer to an ongoing correction or complaint that is repeated over time. While to chide can mean to berate severely, this is not the usual or main meaning. A note on the conjugation of the word chide. There are several different conjugations reported for chide. The past tense is often given as chid, chided, or chode. However, most English speakers will feel most comfortable with chided. The past participle is often given as chid, chided, or chiden. Chided or chiden is most likely to be used by English speakers as chid is not a familiar word in spoken English. The example to follow from author Jack London uses the past participle form chiden. Examples of how to use chide in a sentence. The mother chided her son for eating with his fingers. We eat with a fork, not with our fingers, she said. I was late to work one time and he's been continually chiding me. After writing you such a long letter, I would have expected more than a postcard back, he chided her. As thus he strode along in anger, putting together the words he would use to chide little John, he heard of a sudden, loud and angry voices, as of men in a rage. As the twilight drew on, its eager yearning for the fire mastered it, and with a great lifting and shifting of forefeet, it whined softly, then flattened its ears down in anticipation of being chidden by the man but the man remained silent. Glum. Glum. When someone is glum, they are sad and quiet, gloomy and morose, looking dejected or disappointed seeming depressed, or, in other words, down in the dumps. The adjective glum can also be used to describe a place. A glum place is one that is drab and unattractive. A place that is sad and not fun to be in, such as a glum little hotel room. As an adverb, glum becomes glumly. Examples of how to use glum in a sentence. Don't look so glum. We're still going. The trip is just postponed for one day. Why do you look so glum today? He's been glum ever since he found out his parents were getting a divorce. He could tell by their glum faces that they didn't have good news to tell him about his father. The two sat glumly on a bench, pointedly ignoring one another.
brazen. Brazen. The word brazen means bold and disrespectful and without shame. Obvious and without any attempt to be hidden. Also, brazen means made of brass or to make a sound that is harsh and loud like brass being struck. More rarely, brazen is used as a verb meaning to face with defiance, boldness, and impudence. This is usually used in the idiom phrase, brazen it out. You'll just have to brazen it out and tell him how you feel. Note that this is not a common idiom. Examples. There has been a surge of brazen car thefts throughout the city. He brazenly flirted with the man's wife. Recently, there was a brazen online attack that targeted high-profile Twitter users with a Bitcoin scam. Marcus told me a brazen lie, claiming he once climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. I know for a fact he's never even been out of the country. The building was full of ornate brazen statues. The symbol made a brazen sound that assaulted my ears. Fatuous. Fatuous. Fatuous is an adjective in English. Here is its meaning. Something that is fatuous is silly, inane, and foolish, showing a lack of intelligence or thought. A remark or an action can be fatuous. If we call a remark fatuous, we mean that it is not well thought out and is very silly and perhaps stupid and pointless. A person who always makes silly remarks or does foolish things can also be described as fatuous, but in a self-satisfied or complacent way. In other words, something that is fatuous is stupid but done without self-critique or insight. It is marked by a complacent satisfaction with oneself. The noun version of the adjective fatuous is fatuousness. It can be used to describe the quality of being fatuous. She makes a lot of fatuous remarks. Here, fatuous describes remarks. The fatuousness of her remarks are not surprising given her past behavior. Here, we are saying that her remarks have the quality of being fatuous. It's more efficient to use the adjective version, fatuous, and it makes your sentences shorter and more direct. Examples of how to use fatuous in a sentence. The defense brought up one fatuous argument after another in an attempt to confuse the jury. He dispatches fatuous nonsense to an eager audience. I think he could claim that potatoes were sentient and add another million dollars to his bank account. She's known for her fatuous comments and her ludicrous advice on health matters, but no one can deny that she's a talented actress and even a good singer. He's well-spoken but fatuous. His partner is plain and crude, but savvy and charming by comparison. Glitch. Glitch. A glitch is a temporary malfunction or irregularity in equipment, especially electronics, usually minor. Any small problem or fault that prevents something from working as expected or from happening as expected. An unexpected setback. Also, a false electronic signal or electrical surge. This use in electronics is the origin of the general term. Examples of how to use glitch in a sentence. Electronic voting machines have been criticized for software glitches and vulnerability to hacking. I wasn't able to upload my video because of a computer glitch. After a few glitches, we are finally able to schedule our next lecture. This game has a glitch. I keep getting stuck in the floor. The app maker claims that the problem is due to a glitch in the iPhone's operating system and is not their doing. Aficionado. Aficionado. 
An aficionado is a person who is enthusiastically interested in a particular activity, subject, or pastime and who knows a lot about it. A person who fervently pursues a certain interest that he or she is very knowledgeable about. Examples of how to use aficionado. My son is a video game aficionado. That's a polite way of saying he's addicted to video games. He's certainly a beer aficionado, but I wouldn't call him a beer snob. He likes what he likes. There is no credible evidence that Bigfoot exists, although aficionados insist they have found proof. I found a great YouTube channel called The Professor of Rock. He's quite the rock music aficionado. I'm no aficionado, but I do appreciate a good wine. Classic car aficionados come from miles around to enjoy this event. Cheesy. Cheesy. I'm going to make this video as cheesy as possible. I hope you like that kind of thing. Cheesy has two uses in English. One is more literal, having to do with food, and of course cheese. The other is figurative and informal, and more often used. Meaning number one. Cheesy means containing lots of cheese and having the taste, smell, and consistency of cheese and in regards to non-food items resembling the consistency of cheese. For example, cheesy pizza or a cheesy pasta sauce. Meaning number two, cheap, bad quality, in bad taste or lacking style, blatantly inauthentic, not very good and unoriginal, but in a way that makes it funny, as in a cheesy movie or cheesy song. Cheesy is often used to describe a smile. A cheesy smile is one so exaggerated that it's silly, although probably inauthentic and insincere. The word cheesy surprisingly has been used this way since the 1800s, beginning with college student slang. In those days as well, an ignorant or stupid person might have been called a cheese. Examples of how to use cheesy in a sentence. My building plays the most cheesy elevator music you can imagine. There is a lot of nostalgia for 80s culture right now and movies often reference the cheesy style of 80s movies complete with the music. The movie is full of cheesy effects like talking lions and over the top scenes but with surprisingly good acting. I'm tired of traveling and of endless cheesy hotel rooms. I think it's time to settle down. I know it sounds cheesy, but I think we're going to be together forever. I'm sorry, I just can't take him seriously with that big cheesy mustache. Crabby. Crabby. Crabby is an adjective that means irritable, grouchy, grumpy, ill-tempered, easily annoyed, cranky, complaining, etc. A person can be crabby or be in a crabby mood. Examples of how to use crabby in a sentence. Personally, I'm over the crabby comic shtick. It's been done to death. You're in a crabby mood today, said Carol. Well, I haven't had my coffee yet, replied Madison. Old Jack's the crabbiest person I've ever known, but the things he says are funny as heck. We've been stuck inside too long. Everyone is getting crabby. Faux pas. Faux pas. Faux pas is a borrowed French word or loan word in English. Note that even though it retains its French spelling and seems like a French word, we pronounce it in an anglicized way. Do not try to pronounce English faux pas with a French accent, unless you are French. In French, faux pas means literally false step. A faux pas is a social blunder, a mistake in etiquette or social conduct, an embarrassing or tactless remark in a social situation. 
When you commit a faux pas, you say or do something in a social situation that is embarrassing and that is considered rude, tactless, inappropriate, or that breaks the rules of etiquette or good manners. Today, we hear more often about fashion faux pas than any other type of faux pas. Examples of how to use faux pas in a sentence. We were worried about this president committing a faux pas on the international stage. This, it turns out, was the least of our problems. To me, a fashion faux pas is wearing short pants with a sweatshirt. I told her I didn't like them. What a faux pas. It turns out that they were a wedding gift from her. Celebrities have to be careful of the most minor faux pas as they can become a huge gossip story that gets blown out of proportion. I asked her when her baby was due. What a faux pas. It turns out she isn't pregnant. He has encyclopedic information on cultural moors across the galaxy. Just the droid you would want at your side to keep you from committing the odd destruction of your race faux pas when dealing with aliens. Histrionic. Histrionic. As an adjective, histrionic means overly dramatic or emotional in an insincere way, deliberately affected and contrived, especially to gain attention or to persuade others. Melodramatic. Theatrical. The term histrionic can also mean relating to actors or acting. A histrionic person is a person who has a tendency to display these behaviors. As a noun, histrionic refers to such behavior. Most often, when used as a noun, the term is used in the plural form histrionics. This makes sense since we are usually talking about groups of such behavior rather than just one behavior. Examples. Nobody was surprised when the actor threw the phone at the cameraman. He is known for such histrionic displays of temper. Her histrionic crying at the wedding made everyone very uncomfortable. Histrionic personality disorder is marked by constant attention-seeking behavior that is overly emotional, dramatic, or even seductive. Spanish soap operas or telenovelas are known for their histrionic acting. My mother was quite histrionic. She would react with intense anger or frustration to even the smallest transgression. People love professional wrestling as much for its histrionics as for its action. A method actor, he is known on set for his histrionic reactions to anything that threatens to undermine his method. Maim. Maim. To maim someone means to injure them so badly that they are permanently deprived of the use of part of their body especially to cause permanent bodily harm by causing the loss of a limb or other part of the body. To cripple, mutilate, disfigure, or seriously wound. Also, to impair something in such a way that it becomes imperfect or defective. This meaning is uncommon. Examples of how to use maim in a sentence. He was maimed in a car accident and lost his left arm, but still continued to play the drums with the band. Three people have been maimed this year by the faulty equipment in the factory. Even decades after the war ended, left behind mines continued to maim civilians. My uncle was maimed in a car accident when he was young, but some people don't even realize he's missing a leg. Ad hoc. Ad hoc. Ad hoc is a borrowed Latin phrase commonly used in English. In Latin, it literally means to this. Ad hoc in English is an adjective that is used to describe something that is not planned in advance, but instead is intended solely for a particular purpose or situation without it being applicable to any wider purpose. 
When something is ad hoc, it is created or conceived for one specific purpose. Things that are ad hoc are improvised or created on the spot as a reaction to what happens. Ad hoc can also be used as an adverb and as well it is often used in phrases like ad hoc basis and ad hoc solutions. For example, we deal with problems on an ad hoc basis. These ad hoc solutions are only band-aids. We need to start planning in advance to deal with these weather emergencies more efficiently. More examples of how to use ad hoc in a sentence. The neighborhood residents formed an ad hoc safety patrol in response to the recent crime wave. We used the school gymnasium as an ad hoc polling location. The stadium can be used as an ad hoc shelter during the hurricane. Jaundice. Jaundice. Jaundice is a term used in medical settings to describe a yellowing of the skin and the whites of the eyes due to liver disease and the increase of bile pigments in the blood or by the excessive breakdown of red blood cells. Jaundice is often seen in hepatitis and other liver diseases. And any disease that has jaundice as a primary symptom might be referred to as jaundice. However, jaundice is often used in literary settings to mean something non-medical. As a noun, jaundice means a state in which one's views are distorted due to intense negative feelings such as envy, resentment, hostility, etc. A bitter or prejudiced state of mind. Often, we say we can see the jaundice in an angry person's eyes. Jaundice can also be used as a verb, meaning to distort or prejudice one's views as by anger, jealousy, resentment, etc. For example, his views on friendship were jaundiced by his mistreatment. And it can be used as an adjective, jaundiced. If you look at something with negativity or doubt, you are looking at it with a jaundiced eye. Non-medical examples of how to use jaundice in a sentence. He always looked at politics with a jaundiced eye, so it was a surprise when he decided to run for city council. My attitude was jaundiced by my upbringing, making it difficult for me to fit in. The two families had been feuding for so long, you could see the jaundice in their eyes when they spoke of one another. Al fresco. Al fresco. Al fresco is a borrowed Italian term in English. In English, it means outside, in the fresh air. Al fresco is almost exclusively used to refer to eating outdoors. It is only occasionally used in regards to other outdoor activities, such as in reference to outdoor concerts or other performances. It may sometimes be spelled as one word. Examples of how to use al fresco in a sentence. We were happy to be able to eat at restaurants al fresco during the pandemic. The nice thing about living in the country is that we can grill outdoors and eat al fresco in the summer. Our patio is open for al fresco dining. The theater club is giving an al fresco Shakespeare performance on Saturday. There's an alfresco cafe just around the corner. We can stop there for lunch. During our vacation on the coast, we had the best alfresco seafood dinner. Origin of alfresco. Although it is often claimed that the Italian alfresco translates to in the fresh air or outside, the truth is that the meaning changed when borrowed into English. This is not how Italians use the term. Although the word fresco can mean fresh, Italians usually use it to mean cold, cool, or chilly. Often, al fresco is used to mean in the fridge or in a cool place for storage, which would, of course, serve to keep it fresh. However, al fresco is also used idiomatically to mean in prison. This may be a reference to prisons being cold. 
So if you travel to Italy, don't ask to dine al fresco unless you want to be laughed at, although you probably will be understood. But in Italian, you'll either be asking to dine in a refrigerator or in prison. There are different phrases used to mean eat outside in Italian. Morass. Morass. Morass is another word in English for a marsh, swamp, bogland, etc. In other words, an area of boggy or muddy ground that is difficult to traverse without getting stuck. However, we most often use the word morass to refer to an overwhelmingly complicated and confusing situation. A situation that is difficult to deal with and which impedes progress, making it almost impossible to accomplish anything. An unpleasant situation that is hard to resolve. A difficult and perplexing state of affairs. Examples. People are having difficulty navigating the morass of misinformation about the virus. There is no relief in sight as Congress is once again caught in a bipartisan morass. The company could find no way out of the financial and legal morass and had no choice but to file for bankruptcy. Poor planning made the evacuation a disaster. Citizens found themselves caught in a morass of traffic jams, worse off than they were before. The flood left behind a morass of mud and debris. Pejorative. Pejorative. Pejorative means having negative connotations. Something which tends to express contempt or disapproval. Tending to disparage or belittle. Or tending to suggest that something is not good. Derogatory. Uncomplimentary. Examples of how to use pejorative in sentences. Although the primary definition of cult is a system of religion based on devotion to a certain figure, the term is most often used in a pejorative sense to refer to a relatively small group of people engaged in strange and perhaps sinister religious practices. When people say you are ideological, it's usually pejorative. We often think of the word myth as meaning untrue, but myth doesn't always have pejorative overtones. The word ambitious, when used regarding a woman, tends to be pejorative. It's a shame that to label someone a do-gooder is pejorative. People often use the pejorative term cliché to refer to idioms. Panglossian Panglossian. As an adjective, panglossian means extremely and foolishly optimistic even in the worst circumstances and when facing hardship. A person with a panglossian attitude thinks everything will work out for the best no matter what is happening. The term is sometimes used as a noun. A panglossian person might be called a panglossian. The first known use of the word Panglossian was in 1831. It derives from the name of a character in Voltaire's Candide, Dr. Pangloss. Pangloss was a pedantic old tutor who was an eternal optimist, even after witnessing great cruelty and enduring much suffering. He was even partially dissected and hanged during the Spanish Inquisition. In his words, all is for the best in this best of possible worlds. The name Pangloss comes from the Greek pan, meaning all, and glossa, meaning tongue, referring to the character's shallow talkativeness. A Panglossian person, like Pangloss, might gloss over everything. Examples of use. In the Panglossian world of social media influencers, anything that touches on the actual struggles of life will impact your follower count. 
I grew up barraged with images of a Panglossian technological future complete with flying cars and perfect medicine. The president's view of the virus is at best Panglossian, at worst delusional and dismissive. Our Panglossian complacency has been threatened, and ironically, this may prove to be for the best. Rapport. Rapport. My videos are no nonsense and I take them very seriously, but it's important to me to develop a good rapport with my viewers. Therefore, I try not to take myself too seriously. Meaning of rapport. If two people or groups of people have a rapport, they have a good and harmonious relationship in which both parties trust each other and are able to cooperate and get along easily. If you have a rapport with someone, you have a friendly relationship with them. You understand them and are able to freely communicate with them. Usage of rapport. Note that the T is silent in rapport. When the word rapport is the object of a phrase, the indefinite article A is usually used. For example, have a rapport, build a rapport, or establish a rapport. This is not absolutely necessary, however. Examples of how to use rapport in a sentence. Although she has a good rapport with her staff, she is able to command respect when the time comes. Successful TV shows often live or die on the rapport of their cast members. We have a good rapport with the other parents in the neighborhood. He is not known for his rapport with patients, but there is no better expert on infectious disease. I think you'll find that we all have a good rapport here and we are thrilled to have you join us. He has an unusual rapport with animals. That's why he's such a great vet. I have a new therapist. There was nothing wrong with my old therapist, but I never felt a rapport with him. Rescind. Rescind. To rescind something, such as a provision or rule, means to take it away, to cancel, to revoke, to annul, to take back. In the case of acts of law, to rescind means to repeal or to make void, as by a higher authority. Only Congress can rescind federal laws in the United States. In the case of legal contracts or agreements, to rescind means to abrogate or to remove any responsibility for either party to fulfill the contract as if the contract never existed. Examples. Universities are working to prevent their international students from being deported under provisions that would rescind their immigration status if classes are not held in person. Prohibition in the United States was rescinded under the 21st Amendment on December 5th, 1933. New DNA evidence made it clear that Harris was innocent of any crime. The presiding judge rescinded his conviction. This contract was a mistake for both of us. It's best if we rescind it now. Taciturn. Taciturn. Of a person, taciturn means to be quiet reserved or uncommunicative in speech, reticent, closed-mouthed, tight-lipped. A taciturn person speaks little. Usage of the word taciturn. The adjective taciturn tends to have a connotation of temporary. For example, her husband was ordinarily talkative on such trips, but today he was unusually taciturn. Examples of how to use taciturn in sentences. According to the Washington Post, state health officials have been taciturn about death rates, leaving it to Governor Andrew Cuomo to keep the public apprised of deaths from the virus. Giraffes are known to be taciturn creatures, perhaps due to their long necks. However, they do vocalize occasionally. He's moody and taciturn and hates doing the book signings, preferring to stay out of the spotlight. Compared to the Sherlock Holmes of television, the original character was unemotional and taciturn. 
He's so outgoing and garrulous while his wife is as taciturn as they come, yet they make a great couple. Tome. Tome. A tome is a book, but not just any book. We tend to reserve this term for an especially large, heavy, and learned book, one about a serious and scholarly subject. There are tomes about the history of the Roman Empire. There are no tomes written about fad diets or beauty secrets. Although tome can be used in a respectful manner, it is often humorous, denoting how over-large and unwieldy, in length and in language, such books can be. You might find this word overused on book review websites or YouTube videos where the author is looking for a synonym for the word book. Examples of how to use tome in a sentence. He's the author of several weighty tomes on the sociology of education. He'll be a big hit at the party. Her latest tome on medieval art runs 900 pages. It's a great weekend read. He's not known for writing heavily researched tomes, so it was a surprise when he published his latest work, an historical novel based in feudal Japan. Only in philosophy does a 200-year-old tome become the main textbook in a modern university course.